Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, talk is about cytokine absorption. I thank the organizers, great meeting, very happy to be here in India. And uh, well, we heard about the pathophysiology, and so I think in the sake of time I can skip this. You know all of this, that sepsis induces uh, life-threatening organ dysfunction. And you have different ways, actually, for your patient to get into that. Uh, with the dysregulated host response or infection or combination of both. And there, of course, are various, uh, well, entry ways for infection as well as for, for uh, what we called SIRS in the, in the former time, what today we could call systemic hyperinflammation. And uh, then, of course, if this is uh, leading into organ dysfunction and we, call, we, we collect different organ dysfunction, then this will raise the death uh, rate of these patients. Well, uh, much was said already about the role of hyperinflammation in this, uh, in this uh, 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 instance. And here you see, again, data on how important increased levels of cytokines might be. Actually, both uh, hyperinflammatory, like IL-6, and hypoinflammatory, like IL-10. You see, in this uh, observation, people that had community-acquired pneumonia were followed through their course of, of pneumonia if they developed sepsis out of that. And you see that the mortality was, was substantially high and higher in, in that cohort that had the highest uh, cytokine levels measured uh, as compared to those with the low uh, levels. And this and many other studies basically um, uh, 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 laid the ground for the idea of having a more or less uh, uh, selective cytokine removal ther uh, uh, therapy in the device that basically I'm talking about, that's the cytosorb uh, filter. And uh, one of the major advantages I, me personally feel, uh, is that this is in direct hemoperfusion because you have direct access to uh, not only plasma but uh, all the larger compounds that are in blood that you typically would not access if you have a plasma adsorption as compared to direct hemoadsorption, like in this device. Of course, you want a device that has a substantially, well, positive uh, uh, hemocompatibility, and this is, at least in our hands, seems to be the case. This is the device, and you have uh, a column full of beads, and what makes it more or less specific is the cutoff, uh, the entry cutoff, these pores, to let substances or let not into the large inner surface of these, uh, of these beads. And uh, this cutoff is around 55,000 Dalton. So theoretically, everything in blood that is smaller than that has the chance to enter into this uh, uh, large inner surface and then most probably not get out again. And there is not just cytokines being in this range, but a, a large number of compounds, actually, that we meet again and again talking about pathophysiology of sepsis and other conditions uh, besides sepsis. You see, this is uh, increasing uh, molecular weight, and then we have in the different colors, we have various PAMs and DAMs, so the pathogen-associated molecular patterns that we heard so elegantly before, uh, today, DAMS, so body's own uh, molecules like HMAGB1, uh, and there are several others, of course, the cytokines, all of them. And by the way, just uh, some of the probably inducers of, of liver failure as well, like bilirubin and bile acids. And then there's this cutoff of some 55,000 Dalton, and stuff larger than that would have it extremely difficult to to be directly absorbed, you know, to the inner surface. So we will not really see any loss of albumin being some 65,000 Dalton or larger proteins like coagulation factors and immunoglobulins. One of these hypotheses uh, then is that, uh, and I think it was Thomas Wimler mentioning that, or someone else, uh, uh, that adsorption techniques would especially uh, target those substances that come in very high concentrations, you know, so you will have the strongest effect with regard to removal in situations if you have really increased hyperinflammatory, hypoinflammatory, or other substances that are not in their normal range, and those will be targeted best, while uh, substances that more or less come in their normal concentration 
probably will not be affected as much. This is an important observation. Basically, this was measured for the cytosorb uh, column. Here you see no change as, uh, uh, use, if you use the cytosorb for IL-6 or IL-10. If they come in normal ranges, you cannot see it, but believe me, this is just normal low levels of IL-6, and you remain this activity, you don't remove it like 100%, but there's, uh, uh, if you want so, uh, no attenuation of normal inflammatory response. So how do we use this column? I said in direct hemoperfusion. Typically, me being a nephrologist, we have it in the renal replacement setting, for instance, in CRT, in a pre-filter position. This is what we do. You can have it in a post-filter position, the, the sorbin. It's used together uh, with cardiopulmonary bypass uh, surgery, as you can see here, or with ECMO, uh, same thing. So it's a versatile type of treatment, and you can do it as direct hemoperfusion just on its own, but this is rarely done, at least in Germany, where I come from. Well, as I said, we typically have it in a, in a, in a CRRT situation in intensive care uh, in patients that uh, have sepsis and high dependency on, on uh, vasopressor support. There is not a lot of data. It's a fresh type of treatment. We only have a couple of years. We are waiting uh, for, for, for larger trials that will really tell us what this uh, treatment can do. However, uh, it's in clinical use in Europe and many other countries, uh, among others in India, uh, and people collect data and everyone's invited to support his or her data uh, to the International Cytosol Registry. And I, I just looked this up this morning and there are 142 centers now reporting their, their data to this registry, and we will see some first uh, results in a minute. Well, our first case, I think we were among probably the first, uh, fastest to publish the first uh, 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 case uh, with a cytosorb, and that was uh, one of our dial dialysis patients, an 80-year-old man who didn't feel well at the end of uh, uh, dialysis, collapsed actually, and was diagnosed with pneumonia and pneumonic sepsis, a rush to ICU and intubated, ventilated, and had standard best medical care, intensive care treatment. And then after two days, we were called in to do, well, renal support in this patient. And this is what we did. We had CVVHD applied, and we said, why don't we, as he was quite high in his need for, for norepinephrine, why don't we try this new column, you know? We ran this in parallel, as I told you, in pre-filter position for 24 hours. And see how what happened. We measured IL-6, this is the dark blue line, and there was not extremely high, you know, but, but uh, well above normal uh, with some 700 picogram per mil, and this very nicely came down through the course of treatment. <clears throat> well, that was fine and impressive. Clinically more relevant was that this Okay, thank you. Uh, clinically more relevant was, was, was this development. The new color just comes in time, actually. Uh, uh, we could see a reversal in, in patients' need for vasopressor. No epinephrine dosage could be dramatically lowered. And that was, uh, we were quite impressed with this course as it was clinically safe and easy to use. We said we would probably like to go on doing this treatment. Well, now what data do we have? I said there's no real proof today, but we are so far, I think, on a good way. Uh, it's known as a cytokine sorbent, and there, most measurements are about cytokines, but it's not limited to that. So what do we have in our clinic? The only cytokine parameter that we really can have from our clinical lab is IL-6. So this is what we measured. And see, these were the first nine patients we treated. Two died right away, so they, were, they didn't survive the first day. All the others had a very nice decrease, and please look at this. It's a logarithmic scale, so we really had a dramatic drop in IL-6 in our patients. Uh, it was good. This is another publication. All the publications are rather fresh, as I said. This is from this year, and this group uh, followed their patients. So you see again, they had quite high numbers to start with, and within the first days of treatment, this very nicely came down, again, IL-6 levels. If we ask this this new registry, you know, like what, what, they, what do people report from these 100 plus centers, uh, then again you see pre and post treatment, 
that we see a dramatic drop here from some, some 5,000 to 300. This is mean. And you see there, there's a substantial range from more or less normal to 500,000 picogram per mil, and this nicely goes down. So I think it's fair to at least have the idea that you really can lower your IL-6 levels in parallel to this treatment. Well, again, that's a biomarker and clinically not very meaningful. It's much more meaningful to bring patients out of septic shock. And this, again, is what we saw with the first patients in Rostock, these nine patients. You know, there were, again, two that died early on, and those increased with their need and they died uh, within the first day. All the others had a very nice decrease, especially those with the highest need, actually, uh, of, of norepinephrine, they profited, benefited the most. Uh, and in parallel, we had a stabilization or even increase in mean arterial pressure, as you can see here. Same picture, you see this tendency very nicely, mean arterial pressure going up. And there's first evidence, again, that this is, is doing good to organ perfusion. You know, as you can see, here's the lactate course in this other publication I showed you with a very nice decrease from, from rather high lactate levels uh, these colleagues uh, saw in their refractory septic shock patients. Uh, and they followed the lactate clearance and this uh, again improved through the course of treatment. One very intriguing idea, I think, is this observation that we might impact uh, the integrity, the degree of integrity of our vascular bed in our patients, meaning treating capillary leakage. This, this report, again from, from this year, uh, where colleagues have treated a patient and collected plasma pre and post treatment. And then they went back to the, to the lab, the cell culture lab, and they had human vascular endothelial cells cultivated. If you do that and you color them, this is normal with normal control plasma, and you you, 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 you marker uh, the proteins linking the cells, you see this very nice uh, pattern here, and this is supposed to be normal. If they had the pre-session plasma, you see that, like how these intercellular uh, links, they were more or less destroyed. And this was the picture then later on that looked much more better and resembles this normal level. And what they did is an elegant test that you can do in cell culture, that's called the TEER, T-E-E-R, that's the trans-epithelial or trans-endothelial electrical resistance. And you want this to be high if your cell layer is intact. And see, this is the pre-treatment, there was no resistance left, and this is the plasma from the very same patient, you know, and this very, was very well uh, re-established. And this is no proof of anything, but I think a very intriguing idea that we may restore to, to a certain extent, uh, the, the vascular uh, integrity. And this is what the colleagues uh, conclude, a beneficial observation of extracorporeal cytokine removal in septic shock patients might at least in part be promoted via protection of the vascular barrier function. And this is uh, clearly, I think, uh, worth studying in the future. Well, so how is the course? N no, again, sorry, we are very fresh in this, uh, with this treatment no big data, but what do we have? We already saw this uh, picture. This is animal data. Uh, this was in rats, and this is where the more or less inventors, uh, Callum and friends, uh, compared the, uh, the, the cytokine removal in black uh, versus control in septic rats, and they saw not all, only for IL-6, but TNF-alpha, uh, IL-1 beta, and others uh, that they had a very nice removal and that this would uh, translate into better mean arterial pressure course, so being the upper, and the better short-term survival being the upper uh, line here. And they concluded that, yes, we might, at least in rats, remove various cytokines, increase mean arterial pressure, and increase short-term survival. So what about human data? Uh, uh, that, that's cohort trials, I have to show you. you know, this is. Uh, one you already saw with the lactate uh, clearance, uh, 20 patients included being 60 years old with the usual candidate uh, 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 primary infections uh, with a SOFA score of 14, uh, 
an IL-6 that was rather high, the procalcitonin of 16, so rather six, sick patients. And they were included, and there were seven out of these 20. Uh, they, they died early on, before really the, the treatment was established, and they died from septic shock. So they could not, obviously not be reversed. All the others received the full dosage of this treatment, and there they saw a, a very nice degree of shock reversal. And not all of those that had the reversal survived, but at least from the total cohort, uh, it was some 45%. You know? And in uh, all, the norepinephrine dosage could be lowered dramatically, and the lactate level went to below 2.2 millimoles per liter. Well, and then, of course, they tried to, to argue that this uh, is, is beating uh, the expected mortality, and that, of course, is what you do if you just have the, have the uncontrolled data. But at least it's uh, giving us ideas on uh, how the studies in the future might look at. If we look at the registry that I already referred to uh, with regard to survival and mortality, again, they came out with the same type of uh, observation, that the predicted mortality, if you ask Apache 2 or SAPS 2 score, is, is higher or was higher than the observed mortality. And again, maybe this uh, may lay the ground for controlled trials in the future. Well, what about our data? As I said, we do it typically if uh, some type of kidney dysfunction, acute kidney injury is already there because then we are called into intensive care and we do it in combination. So we looked at our first 30 patients and we were interested in the impact of timing. And we uh, said we would like to see uh, who was started uh, within one day of, not statistically significant, but clearly I would know which, which group I would wish myself into, uh, that was the early intervention. Uh, there was differences in the IL-6 clearance. If, you, if we followed this pattern, this is the whole group of the 30, and you see, yes, there was some nice decrease uh, that was significant. If you take all, all 30 patients, if we went back to those that were these short-term survivors that basically survived the first three days, then we saw that the majority of this effect was in this group, and we had this dramatic drop here. Uh, while there was no significant decrease, there was some, but not significant, in those that, that were the non-survivors. And we concluded two things. Maybe it's worth starting early, probably that's true, you know. Or if you start later, then it's not good enough to have it dosed like we did, like one column per day, you know, for every patient. This is what we do. Maybe we need more intense treatment, but that's good questions, but no answers so far, but this is suggestive for that. Maybe more intense treatment, or maybe we cannot save them. Last thing is, how long did we treat? You know, so we looked at, typically we would say one column for 24 hours, for a day, and then maybe take another one the next day. Uh, Typically, see, this is the whole group on average. Well, we always made it to one day, um, uh, 23.6 hours uh, in the whole group. Uh, but there were many between them that were treated for longer than a day. So, so uh, it was clear that if we would take a closer look, that we see some that are below one day and some that are longer than a day treated. Uh, again, if we look at those, the better group, if you want so, they had a substantially longer treatment time uh, as compared to those that, that died early on. There are two reasons. First, we were not carefully enough, well, persistent enough to really go for it and treat them, or we had the chance to just treat them long enough before they died uh, while we treated them. You know? So at least, I don't know, Longer treatment, early start of treatment, uh, uninterrupted treatment seem to be the better choice with regard to short-term survival, uh, at least in our hands. This is mirrored in a, in a report that, again, is from this year. And here, colleagues basically did the same thing, that they looked at their patients and uh, with regard to when did we start. And within the first day, they, they bet the predicted mortality from the scores. In this, in this case, I think it was uh, SOFA score, uh, uh, predicted ICU and uh, hospital mortality, versus there was, was no much difference if they started later. So they came to the same conclusion that uh, 
the cytoswap treatment uh, resulted in a rapid hemodynamic stabilization and increased survival if they started early on. Well, what's going on? If you, I checked yesterday the clinical trials gov uh, website for clinical um, studies, and if you put in cytosorb, uh, it, it will give you 18 studies that are on the way. And this is, uh, yes, this is in sepsis, various uh, flavors of sepsis, but there's more going on. There's elective uh, cardiac surgery, uh, there's uh, pancreatitis and uh, ARDS and, and many more. Um, and I think we'll hear more about this uh, device in the future. And with this, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. uh, come to my summary. Hemodsorption with cytosorb is well tolerated in clinically ill patients. The clinically ill patients, this is really what we observe, that they really tolerate the treatment well. And it's liked by the by our staff because it's so easy to, to put into the circuit, you know. Um, they appear clinically safe, so we saw no really dramatic side effects. Hemocompatibility is excellent, so we do not really have cell losses or so. A broad spectrum of mediators can be removed efficiently, resulting in decreased serum levels. At least this was proven in animal data and some clinical data. Clinical practice will not often show you lots of cytokine removal because you, we at least cannot measure them clinically. Treatments can have a positive impact on hemodynamics. This is really what I believe in. If you are in septic shock with your patient, then this might bring the patient back. And uh, uh, this can be seen, this effect, and decreased vasopressor need and signs of improved organ perfusion, as you can see, the lactate levels go down and early initiation and continuous treatment seem to correlate with better short-term outcome and there are tons of open points, you know, uh, as usual, the timing, the intensity and frequency of treatments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank attention. you, Professor Mitzner. It's over to the chairperson for the next three minutes for comments and questions. Uh, I, uh, when I use Cytosorb, I combine it with SLED circuit, SLED, slow low efficiency dialysis circuit, and uh, we have noted quite a significant reduction in norepinephrine requirement, and we monitor uh, procalcitonin, and uh, we don't have interleukin-6, but what we have noted is uh, that uh, the inotropic requirement, once it goes down below 50 percent, I just uh, stop using the cytosol uh, and then continue with SLED if it is required further. So the question is that how should one continue, I mean, uh, how long should one continue cytosol, when to stop, and uh, if at all procalcitonin is the only, uh, we don't have inotropin 6 as a marker with us. So are we likely to make some error over there? Well, thank you for that question, you know. It's, uh, to, to be honest, we typically ask for IL-6, and we can have it, you know, but as I said, that's the only marker from this field that we have. Uh, our clinical experience is much more as you describe it, you know, that we, we feel, we see a positive impact if uh, we, we lower vasopressor dose, and uh, we much more clinically steer this as you do, you know, from the clinical picture, uh, to, to the question, how long should, you treat, should we treat, you know, is I think it's fair to say I can stop it uh, if I reach this aim of bringing the patient more or less out of septic shock or have a certain low level of, of vasopressor load. I think in the future we might need to discuss, so just as you do, stop it when you see this result, maybe re-establish re this if, you, if your vasopressor no, load gaze, goes up again, you know. Uh, it might be, uh, I could imagine in the future, if we not only look at the shock situation but on survival really, that we come to terms that we need more continuous longer treatment, you know, and not stopping it early on. But uh, that's too early to say. You know, we go for continuous treatment but we never typically use more than two columns in a patient. Probably that's too short, but we'll see in the future. Okay, that's all, uh, Mr. Chairman. We have time for the discussion. We'd like to thank our chairpersons and speakers, uh, Professor Mitzer, for joining us.